funny how you hear stories at one juncture in your life and you think that was amusing but that will never happen to me Um, as we were going out for the break while ago I noticed that I still had my microphone on and it was still turned on and I knew I was headed to the restroom so I made sure I turned it off Referencing when Mike and I, Mike Gifford and I, were at Harding Graduate School, Brother Harold Hazlip was still the uh, president or director of the Graduate School in Memphis. Uh, he came into chapel one Monday and said he had just been on the road for the weekend visiting, and he and his wife were in Arkansas someplace. He was preaching at a congregation, and he said he taught the Bible class. He had the lapel mic on, had to go to the restroom. He assumed that the sound guy would mute it, and the sound guy assumed that he would mute it. And you know what assumptions do. And Brother Hazlip said when he came back out of the restroom, he said everybody was smiling and just so friendly. And just, he came and sat down by his wife and he said, this is the friendliest congregation I've ever been to. He said, everybody just so happy and full of joy. She said, Harold, we heard everything. <laughs> and then she described all that they heard. So, um, Need to be careful. Before we start into our session this afternoon, or this last session, I probably promise it won't last till the afternoon. Um, I'm so very thankful and honored and humbled by the opportunity to be here today. I know the giants that you've had stand in your pulpit and teach your classes and speak at these days before. I know you could have had anybody do this, and I'm honored that you asked me to come and hope that maybe one thing has been said that would encourage you and strengthen you and motivate you to to think in certain ways regarding our role as men of God. I know that I I have many examples in this congregation that I follow, men that I look up to and and that I hold in great esteem. I'm so very thankful for the opportunity of having a campus of the Georgia School of Preaching and Biblical Studies here. Uh, We strive to be a college-level institution uh, with somebody else paying the tuition for you. Uh, Classes are for anybody, not just for guys who want to preach. So please take advantage of that. I appreciate the great job that Brother Gene Clore has done and now Brother Mike Gifford is doing and directing this campus. And so thankful to the elders and allowing the campus to be here. Uh, we're very serious about training, about doing the very things we talked about in this seminar in GSOP. And I hope you'll take advantage of the things that are offered to you here as a part of that. An opportunity through GSOP that I want to share just very quickly as we go into this lesson, I think really fits the the theme and the tone of this weekend. We have wanted to do a youth leadership camp for some time. I noticed I didn't say a youth preacher camp. There are other camps that are done in our brotherhood by Memphis and other places that are already doing certain things. We did not want to try to recreate the wheel or replicate that in any way. But we did want to have some sort of leadership camp for young men in Georgia who couldn't go to Memphis or Knoxville or some other place. So Lord willing, this summer, we're going to have camp that we are calling Kingdom of Kings from the relationship between Elijah and Elisha. Uh, We call it 64 hours. It'll change your life forever. It is a boot camp done in the template of a military boot camp, but with a spiritual foundation and undergirding. What we're going to do is to try to plant some seeds to help train young men in body, mind, and spirit probably can't see the schedule on the screen behind me too well because it's so small. We'll start with check-in on Wednesday evening, 
We'll go from 0600 at Reveille on Thursday and Friday all day long. We'll have an hour class after some PT and Devo in the morning. We'll have some, an hour of class and then an hour on the PT field to, as a kind of a lab exercise to ingrain the lessons that were just taught in the class. We're going to have guys serving as drill instructors and other things. I'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, these PT activities, uh, especially down at one of the locations we're going to do in South Georgia, we've got a ropes course and a zip line and some other things we're going to do. We're going to replicate those things at other places that we do, though not exactly the same. But we'll push these young men both Thursday and Friday. We're not going to kill them. Uh, we're going to go by the camp insurance regulations in each camp and the camp policies, but we're not going to coddle them. We're going to try to, plant, again, plant some seeds that they will need, not just as leaders in the church, but as godly men. We're going to get them up on Saturday morning, Lord willing, and then put them through a similar thing, a similar, underlined similar to what the Marine Corps does called the Crucible. We're calling it the Centurion Challenge, where we take some of these more difficult PT exercises from Thursday and Friday and kind of put them into one exercise, one deal. And it's all designed to ingrain in their hearts and minds, again, some life skills and lessons that, that should be very, very important. Things like authority in the home regarding our, our submission to the authority of God, the church, society, uh, teaching them respect for authority, respect and responsibility and obedience, duty and service and sacrifice, self-denial. Uh, teaching them things like discipline and purity and holiness and diligence and, and labor and accountability and integrity. and You see all the things on the screen. These are the lessons we're going to try to help ingrain in them during these 64 hours. Brother Eric Owens has written a book that covers a number of the things that we're going to cover in class, so we're going to use that as our class book. And uh, Brother Eric's going to be one of our drill instructors in a former Marine. Uh, so, uh, and he's going to work at both camps for us. We're going to have other, other uh, members of the church, some former military, uh, maybe a good many not. I'm bringing this to you today for two reasons. Number one, because I, I want to publicize it for the sake of your young men, and I'm going to tell you in just a moment who qualifies to come to this camp. But we need volunteers. We need guys to help us staff the camp. And there's a number of things that we can give you to do. You can teach some of the class sessions. During the class sessions, all the young men who are involved in the camp will be together in one place. And then we'll disperse to do the PT afterward. But all the men gonna be in, young men are going to be in one place. So we're going to have a solitary class instructor to teach for 45 minutes and then a number of men to kind of break out the young, young men and, and do some follow-up and, and mentoring about the lessons that were just taught before we go on the PT field. We can use drill instructors, guys who are assistant drill instructors. We're calling all of our people uh, staff NCOs, which means non-compensated officers. Uh, we're, we're not going to be able to pay you money, but I guarantee if you come and you'll be a part of this, you'll be paid. You'll be paid. We need guys to help us in the cabins. We're calling the barracks. We need guys to chaperone, be there overnight with us, uh, to assist the drill instructors, to assist the classroom instructors. We need a number of different roles filled I'll tell you in a moment where the two camps are going to be. If you feel like you have a desire to fulfill one of these roles, even if you don't have former military experience, I have a list, I have a notebook on this table, the Lord's table behind me. Please come up and give me your name and email address. And I'll make sure we're going to, in a, just a matter of a week or two, I'm going to give, Mike Gifford is our webmaster for GSOP, I'm going to give him all this material and we're going to create a section of our website where the registration will be not just for the, the kids who come but also for those who staff it so you'll see more of that on our website and we'll make sure that we publicize that to you but uh, we, we need help with this we need folks who will come and help us and uh, hope that you will try to do that what we're going to do is divide out the young men the camp is going to be from ages 12 to 17 it's going to just be for boys the first year when I first talked to Alan Webster about it and one of his uh, his son was there with us, and his eyes got as big as the end of this microphone right here, and he said, Dad, can I not go to one of my other camps and go to this one? We're going to divide them up. Abel Baker, Charlie, Delta Company. 
Not all the boys that come to this camp are going to be able to do the PT. So we're going to have Delta Company, and they're going to be wavered from the normal PT. We'll do a step-down version of the physical training for them. But we want all the young men to come to class. We want all of them to get what we're going to be teaching in the class. So if you know young men ages 12 to 17, encourage them to sign up. If you have any in your family, encourage them to sign up. Again, we're not going to kill them. We're not. During our normal activities of the week on Thursday and Friday, we'll keep the group segregated in terms of age. But on Saturday, when we go through that, that Centurion Challenge, we're going to put different ages together so the older boys will learn what it's like to reach back and support the weak and pull for the weak and help the younger boys to accomplish these tasks, kind of like you would in a normal military setting, but also in a church setting. You're not just fighting for those in your age group. You're fighting for all of those who are your brothers and sisters in Christ. So that's how we're going to try to work this. And you see some of the things that we'll need. Mostly it's mainly just camp stuff. The one thing I want to emphasize in showing you this list, it's going to be $100 per kid. Uh, about $25 of that goes to pay the camp for the, for the days that we'll be there. The rest of it's for personal things. We have a source for uh, camo trousers, BDUs. They're not BDUs, they're CDUs uh, um, or DCUs, desert camouflage uniform. We can get those $5 a piece. We have a source a guy, a former military, who owns an a Army-Navy store, he's going to give us the camo trousers, $5 a piece. We can get the T-shirts for $5 a piece, and, and we can outfit you if you'll help us. We won't have to spend any money except just to get there. The one thing we're not going to allow these young men to bring are their cell phones, their personal electronic devices. Now, if they have their Bibles on those, we'll have paper copies of the Bible that, that we will issue them. All of the instructors, all the staff people will have their cell phones, their PEDs, so if there's an emergency, we can call mom and dad, that sort of thing. But we, we want to try to separate them from those things for just a couple of days and show them, hey, you can't exist without these. And you can do pretty well if you try. So that kind of tells you what we're going to do. Let me tell you where. May 31st through June 3rd, we're going to, uh, 3rd, we're going to be at uh, Camp Wetoga up at Morganton up near Blue Ridge. And in July, July 19th through 22nd, we're going to be down below the Nat Line in sunny Valdosta, South Georgia Bible Camp. Now, picture that, South Georgia Bible Camp, Valdosta, Georgia, July. That's going to be interesting. We're going to hydrate the boys. We're going to make sure they got plenty of shade and places where they can get in front of fans if they need to. We're going to take care of them. But we're also going to push them. And we're going to give them a, a structured, disciplined environment and motivate them. The greatest thing we want to do for them are have the guys who are part of the staff, even if some of the guys can't come for just one day or one morning, if everybody can show back up on Saturday for the closing ceremonies and have all these godly men all dressed the same, all there on behalf of these young men to encourage them and motivate them and support them and be there to celebrate their making it through this camp, that will say to these young men, hey, I do have some men of God who are older than me, who care about me, who are willing to give up time fishing or whatever else to be here for me. We hope that's one of the greatest lessons that it will put in their minds and their hearts. So please, if you have a desire to help us, even if you can just give us just a few hours at one of these camps, please come and sign up on this list. Give me your email address. You might want to indicate, if you do, what camp you think you could be a part of. And if you, you can only come for a few hours, then we certainly can use you for that and certainly want you for that. So please uh, help us with this. We're calling a camp like no other. Teaching lordship and leadership. The lordship of Christ and the leadership of godly men. Embracing our message. First look at this title, think that or gives us the thought that maybe we're going to talk about the gospel. The gospel is our message. The Bible is our message. And, of course, we embrace that the day we became Christians, even before. Part of that's incorporated in what I'm going to get at, but mostly what I'm trying to get at is our communication behavior as men, as men of God. On the banners that you've seen, it talks about the man of God and his tweets. Everybody's heard of Twitter, started in 2006. 
1.3 billion people use it. Wow, that's tremendous. 500 million tweets a day. It's a conversation stream of 140 characters. It's basically a, just a little short blast of a message you can just send out. Even our president uses it. You can evaluate that however you'd like to. Probably one of the most powerful things about this, look at the followers. We talked about followers last hour. 208 active followers for every registered user. And you multiply that time 1.3 billion. Man, that's a lot of people talking. It's a lot of people talking. One of the top 10 sites that you'll ever visit on the web. Jack Dorsey was one of the co-founders of Twitter. He's a young guy. <laughs> he surely benefited from it. His net worth is now $439 million just from Twitter alone, just from the stock. The key word behind Twitter, of course, communication. The expression of thought. The sharing of what's in our hearts. The exchange of information so that there is shared understanding. Communication. Let me ask this question. What do we as men of God say to the world, to our followers, to those who encounter us, through our words? through this powerful, powerful aspect of our bodies known as the tongue. What do we communicate? What is our communication behavior like? Jesus says, let your yes be yes, your no be no, for whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Matthew 5, 37. So there's a need for economy of words. It's not how much you talk. I guess it is, but it's more what you say. And to have a self-discipline about what you say. Proverbs 18, 21, death and life and the power of the tongue. Those who love it will eat its fruit. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. Evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they'll give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you'll be justified, and by your words you'll be condemned. That's a powerful scripture, isn't it? Can you imagine the Lord taking record individually of the, the idle words that we say? How many of you know exactly how many words you said yesterday? The number. Of course, none of us do. How many of you know the quality of what you said yesterday? Overall. Just to think about one day's conversation and how many books that would fill. I saw a statistic one time about that. It's amazing. But the Lord I mean, will we'll give an account for every idle word that we speak that's still out there not covered by the blood of Jesus. It's amazing. The tongue's powerful. Do not be rash with your mouth. Do not let your heart utter anything hastily before God. God is in heaven, you on earth. Therefore, let your words be few, Solomon says, Ecclesiastes 5, 2. Let your words be few. How many of you have known men in your lives? You don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you know men in your lives that didn't talk much, but buddy, when they said something, it, you listened. It was powerful and it was profound, and they weren't like a, a relative of mine. I shouldn't say this. Beloved uncle, all he did was talk. Matter of fact, my father said that when he was young, he was like the older brother. My father was a baby. He said, we all called him radio because you couldn't turn him off. And we all swore that he was vaccinated with a Victrola needle because that's all he knew to do was just run his mouth. Well, that's not the behavior of a man of God. Psalm 39.1, I'll guard my ways lest I sin with my tongue. I restrain my mouth with a muzzle while the wicked are before me. You ever had somebody take something that you say that you really didn't mean what you, in terms of the way they took it, but they took it and, that, boy, they used it against you and they arrayed this army back against you because of one thing you said? That's powerful. Especially when we open our mouths as men of God. In this catalog of sins that Paul talks about with the church at Rome, chapter 1, verses 29 and 30, the focus a lot of times that when we study Romans 1 is the homosexuality that's talked about there. But notice, notice the verbal sins, the verbal things, or the things tied to a verbal nature. Deceit, whisperers, backbiters, boasters. These are verbal things. 
they come out of a heart, like Jesus said, that's not good, but they're verbal expressions that are acts of sin, that are just as sinful in the eyes of God, just as wrong in the eyes of God, as the other things that we look at, like homosexuality and lesbianism and the other things that Paul addresses there in Romans chapter 1. The tongue's powerful, and it can create for us a wonderful opportunity to do good, but also an opportunity to allow our adversary to have an advantage. James says, if anyone among you thinks himself to be religious, and he doesn't bridle his own tongue, but he deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Did you ever think about that? James says, what's one of the purposes of your quote-unquote religion, your relationship with Christ? To help you be able to bridle your tongue. To speak the right thing in the right way, in the right quantity, in the right circumstance. To bridle it, to, to, to put self-control or self-discipline, to put reins on the tongue. Part of our message should be that we strive to use this very powerful instrument in proper ways that would, that would have a good effect on those who hear us talk, those who are recipients of the words we say rather than them becoming a liability to them, which in some cases they do. Solomon says the hypocrite with his mouth destroys his neighbor. Proverbs 11 and verse 9. You think about all of the falsehood that was said against Jesus. You think about all the falsehood that's circulated now in the news media. We hear about fake news. Well, fake news, if it's being told as if it were real news, is nothing more than just simply a lie. That's all it is. Fabrication, a lie, something that is not true. I may as well impugn my younger daughter since I impugned my oldest daughter earlier. Ashley's a precious young lady. She was her... Daddy's girl, I was the first one that held her out of the womb. She's been a daddy's girl ever since. But she had a weakness in her young life. She could not seem to tell the truth. She'd get in trouble. Man, she'd tell a whopper. Even if she knew, we knew she was telling a whopper. And Debbie and I prayed about it and we talked about it and what are we going to do to help Ashley finally I said, I'm going to just take some drastic action. I went in and opened the book of Revelation where it talks about all liars having their place in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. When I showed her that and I read it to her emphatically, her little eyes just bugged out of her head. I don't know that she's told a lie since. Lies destroy people. The hypocrite with his mouth destroys his neighbor. As males, it is true that communication, whether you're male or female, but especially in this context, is a skill that we need to work on, right? Somebody say amen. It's a skill we need to work on constantly. Constantly. We're born with the tools. We develop the tools, but the skills are learned to behavior. It's not something that you ever, ever really, really get a handle completely on. You have to constantly work at it. Especially where it involves listening. Brother Keeble used to refer, Marshall Keeble used to refer to James 1, 19, where, where the text says, let every man be swift to hear and slow to speak. He says, we got two of these and one of these for a reason. You need to do twice as much of this, we do of this. That's colloquial, it's southern, it's country, but it's true what James is saying. Our communication, our message, our overall message and our individual communiques, they reflect our psychological makeup. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But they also reflect our spiritual makeup, makeup our spiritual condition, where we are spiritually. We'll talk about how that manifests itself more in just a moment. And of course, as I've already said, as James and others say, words are powerful. Experts in the field of communication, and one of my degrees from Fried Hardman's in communication. 
Experts in the field, you've probably seen some of these numbers, they vary. Experts in the field of communication say we speak about as ha half as much as our female counterparts. Please don't say amen. Somewhere between 7,500 and 10,000 words a day. That's a lot. You think about it. Get home at night, our tongues ought to be tired. That's a lot of talking. But that's what we do, according to the experts. According to them, we're left-brained. We talk about logic. We come in the evening, our wife says, Honey, how was your day? And we start, usually start giving her a list of the things we did. According to what all I've read, that's not what she's asking. She wants, you to know, wants to know how you feel about your day. Do you feel good? Do you feel bad? Are you happy? You don't want a list. But that's what we, we go to the left brain. We have positive speech patterns. Usually, if somebody asks us or engages us in a conversation about something we like. Man, you get some guys talking about fishing and golf and hunting and NASCAR and just the stuff, woodworking, the things they like. Oh, talk your ear off. Talk the horns off a billy goat. But then you engage them about matters of the heart. The more right brain stuff. It's not so easy in some cases. The negative, again, we need to work on listening. We're poor sometimes at expressing how we feel and managing somehow the content that we receive from our wives. We are just as prone to verbally sinning and to misbehaving with our tongues as are our female counterparts. I've heard preachers preach lessons before and talk about all the women in the Bible that said things they ought not to say that spoke up at the wrong times and said the wrong things. Well, we're just as adept at that. It's a potential for us as well. So before we point a finger, we need to consider that. I don't know if you're familiar with a guy named Mark Gungor. He's not a member of the church. He's a denominational person. He does a lot of seminars on marriage. He's superb. Now, anytime you hear a denominational person lecture on anything, it's like reading denominational material. It's like eating fish. You've got to spit the bones out. Okay? He doesn't talk a lot about plan of salvation, doctrine from that sense. But he does talk an awful lot in his seminars about marriage. And he does it from a, in a very humorous context and landscape. As a matter of fact, his website is called laughyourway.com. Laughyourway.com. And his seminar is called Laugh Your Way to a Better Marriage. I don't know if you've seen any of the excerpts of it on YouTube. Plenty of them out there. I think the seminar lasts maybe four or five hours. So it's a lot of footage to watch. But there's one segment of it I want to talk about just now, highlight, and it's a segment some of you may have seen. Any of you seen this? Tale of Two Brains? It is hilarious, isn't it? it, I, it, it is, but it is so powerful and true. He says, our brains are like a series of boxes, and, and each box is labeled. We've got a box for the car, a box for the house, a box for the kids, a box for the wife, a box for the career, a box for the hobby. And when our wives and others engage us in conversation, we pull out that box, and we open it, and we talk about only what's in that box. Since Debbie and I have watched this several times, I'll be doing something on the computer in the morning while she's getting ready to go to work, and she'll ask me a question about something else. I said, wait a minute, I'm in my Bible box right now. Hang on. We've made it a joke, but it's true. It's true. We talk about what's in that box, and Gungor says our favorite box is our nothing box. There's nothing in that box, and we don't want anything in it. And we'll go to that nothing box every time. Don't talk to me. Leave me alone. I'm finished with my 10,000 words. I'm done. I got my, all my boxes are closed, and the cabinet where I keep them is closed. Leave me alone. Well, that's different, as Gungor says, in terms of the way women process information and how they speak, how they talk. It's important for us to know as men of God, not just about communication and how it affects our relationship with God and each other, but why we communicate in the ways that we do. 1 Samuel 25 and verse 17. His name is Nabal, married to Abigail. He has a run-in with the servants of David, King David. And David is basically coming after him. 
And one of the servants of Nabal says to Abigail, his wife, he says that Nabal is such a scoundrel that no one can speak to him. And, and later when Abigail encounters David and she begs David not to come and engage her husband, she also calls him a scoundrel. Can you imagine that? You imagine your wife looking at you that way? Well, here the servants of Nabal says he's a scoundrel because you can't talk to him. You know any guys like that? You know any guys that just, you know, you go and try to talk to them. It doesn't mean they're poor listeners. It means they just won't hear you. Whether it's hard-heartedness or they shut you out in terms of being able to listen to you or they refuse, whatever it is, sometimes, guys, we can be stiff-necked and uncircumcised of heart and ears. Remember Acts 7. Stiff-necked. You can't tell me anything. I had a discussion with a guy one time about alcoholism, and he said, you can't tell me it's wrong. Well, from the background that I had with my dad, I said, well, you can't tell me it's right. And sometimes we draw lines like that in the sand, so to speak, in conversation with each other, and we get to a point where we're just not going to listen when we turn the other person off. You know, we've made our decision, and, and non-verbally or otherwise, here's what we do. Okay, door shut. You can talk all you want. I'm not going to listen to you. When we develop a heart like that, and I know there's some things we don't need to hear, but when we develop a heart like that, let us be careful not to develop that same hard heart where God is concerned. In Revelation chapters 2 and 3, in those letters to the seven churches of Asia Minor, there are several things that are repeated, and one of the things that's repeated each time that these seven churches in Asia Minor are addressed is this phrase, and you can complete it with me, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. In other words, you need to listen. You need to pay attention to what's being said to you. One of our classes in GSOP, World Religions, we talk about Taoism, religion that is found in Vietnam and other parts of the Eastern world. Taoism, it is said, is a very selfish religion. It focuses on, on, on the person. You're not focused on the welfare of anybody else. The way Taoism is taught, usually it's taught from a what is considered a holy man or a monk or, or someone who is a priest of some kind. And usually he's much older and he's teaching a young male who's much younger. I read a story, may be true, may be fable about Taoism. It says a young student came to his priest, his teacher one time, to be taught and they sat down. And as the, as the priest began to teach him the fundamentals of Taoism, everything he said, the young man stopped him. I know that. So the priest would try to go in a different direction, teach him something else. I know that. Everything the priest said, this young man said, I already know that. In other words, you can't teach me anything. So finally, out of exasperation and wanting to make a point, the Taoist monk, the Taoist priest, handed the young man a cup. He took a cup. He took a pitcher of hot tea, and he began to pour the hot tea into the young man's cup. When it got to the top, he just kept pouring. He didn't stop. And the hot tea started spilling out of the young man's hand, and he threw the cup away and chasing the old man because he would keep pouring the tea. Why did you do that? He said, because your heart is like this cup. It is so full of what you think you already know that you can learn nothing from anyone else. He said, go your way and only come back when your cup is empty. In other words, when you think you don't know everything. Hopefully, one of the things that maturity and experience and being a student of the Word of God teaches us as men of God as we get older is that we don't know everything. Right? We don't know everything. And we're so certainly open to learning more because we don't have a monopoly on knowledge. That attitude sometimes is, is so easy to detect. There's an old poem that says, you can tell a freshman by his, his silly, eager look. You can tell a sophomore because he carries one less book. You can tell a junior by his dashing air and such. And you can tell a senior, but you can't tell him much. 
because he knows everything. He's already there. Regardless of where we find ourselves in our path as, God, as godly men, as men of God, let us never develop the attitude that there's nothing else we can learn, that we know it all, that we've arrived, and that no one has anything of value to say to us that we need to hear. Jesus' message was always delivered properly, regardless of the circumstance. Luke points out in chapter 4, verse 22, that all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words that proceeded out of his mouth. And they doubted that this was the son of a carpenter. The implication is he, mu he must have been schooled somewhere because carpenter's sons, they just don't speak like this. That doesn't mean that every word that Jesus said was warm and fuzzy. Matthew 23 Scribes, Pharisees, chief priests. One of the most scathing chapters in all the Bible. Blind guides, fools, hypocrites, family of snakes. Pretty strong. Jesus knew what to say, the proper words to say, in the proper circumstance. And he also knew when it was time not to say anything at all. While he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. When Pilate began to question him, he answered him not a word. Remember in John 8 when they brought the adulterous woman? They challenged him, you know. Moses says this, this is what happened, what do you say? He didn't say a word. What did he do, remember? He's down on the ground and he writes. We still don't know what he wrote. Heard a lot of conjecture about that. The point is he didn't just lash out and jump in the deep end of the pool with his mouth and, and fall into their trap. Sometimes it's a wise thing, especially when we're put in a pressurized situation, to hold our tongues. As a part of our message, practicing that economy of words, let me ask some questions as I kind of draw this last and final session to a close, and I wanted to give some time for us to have some discussion maybe before... We adjourn for lunch. Your words are powerful. The things that, that you gen up and generate out of your heart and mind have great power. What are you going to do with your words? Do you make a decision every day that, that you're going to have a direction in the things that you say? You can't always do that because some conversations incidental. Some of the ways we use and project our message is just, you know, you pull into the McDonald's drive through you didn't rehearse back at 6 o'clock in the morning you were going to ask for a sausage egg McMuffin. That's what you have to do. But what are you going to do with those words in your life that you're going to deliver in pivotal circumstances that are either going to make or break a potential listener? Are you going to give the impression to someone that you don't care? And maybe that impression is given to your wife. She's talking to you about something that's it's powerful to her and it's pivotal in her life and you're sitting there with the remote control. You've already spoken your 10,000 words for the day. You're done. I've had many couples to come. I was still preaching full time and trying to help folks with their marriages. They would come and, and, and many times she would say, he won't listen to me. He won't talk to me. We come in at night and he gets the remote control and he won't say a word. And then you switch over to him and he says, all she does is nag me. She won't ever hush. She won't ever be quiet and just leave me be. She just always got to be saying something. The reality of that situation could be not that he's trying to shut her out or she's trying to nag him to death. It may just be that she's not finished with her 15,000 words. And she saved a good many of them to come home and tell to her soulmate. But it may be on the other side of the coin that he's done. I mean, he's finished his 7,500 to 10,000 words. He's finished, and all he wants is quiet. It doesn't mean that either one of them is trying to do anything to intentionally hurt the other one. It just means that maybe they're going down the road of how they've been wired. But still, even that's not an excuse for us to 
ignore and refuse to engage those that we love and those who are following us, those who share our lives, if they have something important to say to us, we need to pay attention. And sometimes just paying attention and just listening is what they want. So much that I've read about why <clears throat> females share with males what's in their heart is they come and share with us those things just because they need somebody to listen and care. And what does the man do? Well, give me a wrench, I'll fix it. You know, here's what you need to do. You need to do this and you'll fix it. That's not what she wants to know. She doesn't want to know how to fix it. She just wants you to care enough to pay attention to her and listen. And as a man of God, that's exactly what we should do. What impact do we seek with our words? Do we seek to get people told? Or do we seek to say the right thing in the right circumstance? Do we utilize an economy of words? Do we pay attention to the volume in terms of the number of things we say? And then do we stand behind the things that we tell people? When we make a promise, we say, yeah, I'll be there on Saturday. Do we fulfill that promise? If we don't, be sure that that person who heard you make the promise will remember. And they do. If you could turn on a tape recorder, if you could go home and take a digital tape recorder or something, if you got an old cassette player, if you could go home and turn on a tape recorder and record your daily conversation with your spouse and your kids and your fellow Christians and your co-workers and other people, how much of your communication on a daily basis would be negative, critical, condescending, or carnal. Several years ago, I was in a marriage seminar and heard about adult and child tapes. And what this instructor was trying to say is that sometimes husbands, men, talk down to their wives, and in that conversation, the husband engages his adult tape and expects to have his wife engage her child tape. In other words, he's talking to her like he's the adult and she's the child. And after several years of that, a rash of divorce happens because the wife gets tired of being talked to like he, she is subhuman. This same instructor in this same seminar said a majority from what he had seen in the data that he knew of circumstances where those kinds of things happened in marriages, happened in marriages of men who were very successful in business. And of men who were in ministry. Divorces after 35 and 40 and 45 years of marriage because the wife just couldn't take it anymore. I have a newspaper clipping in my files of a trial where a woman was being charged with murder. She was not a Christian. The story in the newspaper article was that her husband would not talk to her and engage her. He would not listen to her. He completely shut her out, kind of like the things we've been talking about already. His message to her was, get away from me. I don't want to talk to you. I have my television, I have my remote control, that's all I need, just tell me when supper's ready. Finally, one day she got tired of it. She came to the living room, like she always did. She said, honey, I need to talk to you. He's got missile lock on the TV, he's got his remote in his hand, and he doesn't say this verbally, but he basically says, leave me alone. So she goes into the bedroom and she gets his 357 Magnum. She comes back in the living room and she puts the first three bullets into the television. She puts the next three into his skull.
And at her murder trial, it came out that they had been married 17 years. And during their courtship, he was loving and kind and gracious and, and caring and wanted to listen to her and talk to her. And, but after the I do, that was it. She said, I just can't take it anymore. If you could record your conversations on a daily basis, how much would be encouraging, affirming, positive, spiritual? Not just talking about the Braves or the Falcons, but talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John with your wife, your kids, people who are closest to you. What will others remember of us when they think of our verbal footprint? Because that's what we make. We make a verbal footprint as men of God in the hearts of others who listen to us and are impacted by us. Brother Marshall Keeble, in talking about constraining the tongue, as James says, used this illustration. He said, we need to think of our teeth as like bars in a cage. And we need to think of our tongues as like a wild animal. And if we keep the bars of that cage closed, then that animal can't get out and hurt anybody else. That's powerful. That's good advice for the man of God. Here's one other application, and we'll close. Not everything we say is said with our tongue. Sometimes it's said with our fingers. In places like Facebook Messenger, chat rooms, and other scenarios where we are drawn in and enticed and lulled by the illusion, first of all, that all of this conversation that we're having with this other person of the opposite sex who's not our spouse is innocent. And then somehow it gets out of control and it crosses over the bridge of innocence into the land of where it ought not to be. But you see, it's private. Nobody knows. You know, type these IMs and then I can erase them. They're gone. Poof. There's no accountability. And so many guys, many guys who are addicted to internet pornography are also addicted to internet chat and texting and the communication of messages in ways and scenarios that are just as sinful as opening our mouths and uttering the most vile form of profanity that you can think of. Brothers, we need to be careful. The internet's a wonderful tool we should use it for God's glory. But let us make sure that we keep a filter, a spiritual filter on our hearts and minds and keep a distance from folks who would engage us like this. I guarantee you there are people out there, they want nothing more to engage in this kind of conversation. Some of them for the wrong reasons. One of my daughters told us the other day she heard about a scenario she teaches elementary school, heard about a scenario where a fifth grade young lady was talking to somebody online that she thought was also a fifth grader. He was a 35-year-old pedophile. She gave him her cell phone number and her mama and daddy's address. And all of a sudden, she got to thinking, you know, maybe I need to tell mom. Fortunately, she did tell her mother. They alerted the authorities, and the authorities were there when he drove up at their house from three states away. What is our message, men of God? What do we communicate by the words we say, by the way we listen, and by the influences that we allow come into our hearts and minds. If I have a final message or word of encouragement to any of you, 
It is to conduct your life, and that message is pointed back at me, to a level of excellence that is befitting of Christ in everything we do, in everything we say, in every relationship of life, to hold ourselves to a standard of excellence that is beyond reproach. That even when the adversary wants to say something, everybody says, that's not true. I know this guy. It's just not true. Who was it? Mark Twain or someone said we should live in such a way that when we die, even the undertaker will be sorry. Former President Jimmy Carter tells in his memoirs of his young days when he was a an ensign in the United States Navy. You may have heard this story. Bear with me, I'm an old man, I repeat myself a lot. That's my communication behavior. Jimmy Carter went to Georgia Tech for two years and then transferred to the Naval Academy. Received his commission in the United States Navy and while he was an ensign, he wanted to get into the nuclear submarine program. He passed a battery of tests, did well on them. There was one final door, one final chapter, one final test you had to go through. And that was to have a personal interview with then Captain Hyman Rickover. Later became Admiral Hyman Rickover. He's the guy with all the stuff on his sleeve, of course. Then Captain Rickover's reputation was very well traveled. He was known as a no-nonsense, steely-eyed wall that you could not befriend, that you could not sway. I mean, there were, there were fables told about guys who went in to be interviewed for him. One of the things that, that, Admiral, that Captain Rickover would do, he would take a wooden chair and put it in the room where you came in for your interview if you wanted to get into the nuclear sub-program, and he would saw either the front two legs off or the diagonal legs off so that when you sat down in the chair, either the chair almost spilled you out on the floor or it rocked with you like this and you were totally uncomfortable the whole time you sat there on purpose. He didn't want you to be comfortable. He wanted to test you. Jimmy Carter said when he walked in the office, walked in the room that day, knocked on the door, heard a voice say, come in. He walked in. Captain Rick, o there were two chairs in this big round room. Captain Rick over already sitting in one. Here's this wooden chair. Jimmy Carter said he sat down and he almost fell out of the chair. But he steadied himself and he sat there ready for the questions. He said for a long time, Admiral Rickover didn't say a thing. His countenance never changed, kind of the expression on his face and the screen behind me. He just sat there just steely-eyed. Jimmy Carter said it was like he was staring holes through the back of my skull. He said, I was so nervous. He said, after a long time, Admiral Rickover, though never changing his countenance, his expression, said to me, talk about things you know about. So Jimmy Carter began to talk about naval warfare and historical battles the Navy had been in. He talked about military strategy talked about the, universe, the uh, Uniform Code of Military Justice, UCMJ. And when he finished and he got through all of that and he didn't know what else to say, he started talking about peanut farming because he knew about that. And he talked about sports and the arts. And when he got through, he said none of what he said, he said he felt like he talked for 20 minutes, none of what he said evoked any kind of reaction from Captain Rick over. He said he just sat there just steely eyed Never changed his expression, never nodded his head, nothing. Mr. Carter said after several minutes, very uncomfortable minutes, where he began to sweat. And Marick over said, tell me about your education. Jimmy, Jimmy Carter said, oh, all of a sudden, here's something I can pound my chest about. He said, I finished 59th in a class of 800 and whatever it was in the Naval Academy. 59th, a class of 800 and something. Felt great about that. Pounding his chest, you know. Ugh. He said, Admiral Rickover never nodded, never changed. He just stared at him. And after several minutes, he asked him two final questions. In 
response to what Mr. Carter said about finishing where he did in the Naval Academy, his graduating class, Admiral Rickover said, number one, did you always do your best? Jimmy Carter said at first, he wanted to say, well, sure, yes, sir, I did all, yes. But then he thought, you know, there were times when I had exams or exercises in the field, probably didn't always do my best. So after several minutes, he said he swallowed that big knot in his throat, about the size of a golf ball, really hard. And he said, no, sir, I don't guess I did. He said, Admiral Rickover never changed his expression, but after a few minutes, he simply turned his chair around. Now his back is to Jimmy Carter. And he asked him his final question. Why not? Why not? Mr. Carter said, I sat there for what seemed like an eternity and I couldn't think of a good answer. I mean, why hadn't I done my best? He said, I finally got up and left the room. Didn't know what else to say. So brothers, for us, two questions. As a man of God, Have we always done our best? The answer to that question is no. Second question is still the same. Why not? If anyone has ever done their best, we call his name Jesus. He did it because of his relationship with his father and because of the relationship that he wanted to have with all mankind with every single one of us sitting in this room today. So brothers, will we go forward from this place? Whether we take anything out these doors, anything else that's been said, will we go forward from this place with a resolve in our hearts? As men of God, in that role, to always do our best, in everything we're called to do and in everything we say. Our followers need us to make that pledge to ourselves. Because how else can we possibly seek to motivate them to do the same? Let's pray. Our Father, we are so humbled and grateful that you have always done your best for us. And that our older brother, your son and our Savior, can say the very same thing. Help us, Father, as men of God to care so much about our username and our password, how we're seen and perceived in public, but also how you see us. Help us to care deeply about our mission, about those who will come along and march after us. 
Help us to care about the things we say and how we say them and how we use our tongues, the power of the words that we utter. What an honor, Father, you have given us to be created in your image, to serve as the head of our home, as those who have a place of authority and preeminence in the church behind our Lord Jesus, who is the head. Those honors, Father, go deeply into our hearts and motivate us to offer to you not just the scraps of our lives, but the very best that we have. Thank you, Father, for always giving your best for us. Help us resolve as men of God to embody the very same. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. You know, in life, we, uh, we prepare, we perform, we prepare, we perform, we prepare, we perform all throughout our lives. Well, this has been one of those opportunities to prepare. Um, it's been given great lessons, thank you, David, to help us prepare. And I hope you'll take it to heart and, uh, and you'll study more about what we're talking about. You'll, you'll pray more to God about what we've been talking about. Because we got to become the best version that we can be, that God wants us to be. So we can do our best for him. So thank you again for all for being here. Thank you again, David, for your great study and your lessons that you've given to us. So we'll wrap up here. We'll have lunch. It's probably already downstairs. I don't know if you can smell it yet, but uh, maybe you can. I believe it's already there for us. In a minute, we'll have a song and a closing prayer, uh, too. Um, and whoever's doing that, Daryl, uh, don't forget the food. Um, Scott Sitton also wants to say a few words right after me, uh, if he wants to come up here. Uh, I want to thank all of those who stepped up and helped uh, with the organization of this today, we, again, uh, like last year, had nearly 30 men uh, working uh, in some capacity somewhere uh, to make this a success, and I think it was a success. Um, and is Tom here? Tom Martin? There he is. Don't leave uh, after our closing prayer. Uh, if you would all, and David too, come up here. Let's get a group picture, uh, uh, okay? And then, uh, and then we'll go downstairs. Okay, real quick, I just want to echo a couple of things that Mike just said. But um, I want to thank everybody for being here. We've had the same number. Friday night, pretty much the same number. Friday night, this morning for breakfast and both of those sessions, which is really incredible when you think about it. Everybody's been here and stayed here. Um, I do want to thank Brother Decker. Incredible time. You talked about how the speakers we've had beforehand, it's going to be tough to top this. Um, anybody that can bring Andy Griffith into a message, you got to love him any, even more. Even somebody can say, Judy, 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 as well as you did. You have to say it again because I can't do it. It's really, that's incredible. Um, I want to thank you. I also want to thank the guys that led singing, Jake, Hal, and Tom. And also, if you get a chance, Tom has an anniversary coming up tomorrow. It's 29th anniversary. So you can go congratulate him on, on that. Um, but two guys I really want to thank because being a part of this a few years ago, it gets very difficult and it gets very intense. And there's a lot of worrying that goes on. And there's a lot of hoping that everything runs like you want it to. Y'all met Mike because he's the one that stood up here. 
So please give him thanks. And as we heard last night, the guy with the perfect beard, who now will never be able to shave again, Brian Strickland right back there, be sure and thank him also. But thanks guys again for being here. All right, let's close with a song. Since this song ties in so perfectly with our theme, and since we've sung it at every session so far, let's go ahead and close with 553 again. Rise up, O men of God. Let's go ahead and stand, too. 553. Rise up, O men of God. It's always a blessing. Let us pray as we close. Almighty God, we're so thankful for this day that we've been blessed with to be able to come and hear words about you and to learn more about your word. We're thankful for uh, last night's lessons and this morning's. If it hasn't touched any of your heart, of our hearts, then it's our own fault because there's been some powerful things said and just pray, Father, that we can learn from it, uh, grow from it, and be better men uh, of you, that uh, we can be better leaders, not just in our communities and not just here in, in this building, but especially in front of our, our families, our kids, our grandkids, and our, and our wives. It all starts at home, and I just pray that we can be the spiritual leader that we need to be. And we pray, Father, that you'll help us grow in our spirit in a way that we can continually uh, seek through your word uh, to be better people. And we pray that we can grow in our, in our wisdom and have the strength and the courage to stand up for what's right in such a bad world that, that's around us. And we just pray, Father, that uh, you'll help us grow in our knowledge. And the only way to grow in our knowledge is continually seek your word and, and, and study your word and live it. We need to walk it. And there's no gray area in being a follower and a leader either. We, there's times to follow and, and a time to lead. And the time to follow is, is to live our life and, and try to live it by the examples that you have set for our brothers before us many years and many centuries ago. And we pray that we can be the leaders to help these young men. And we need more gospel preachers and we need them to understand the importance of it. And they are the future of, of your church 
And we just pray, Father, that we can be the example to them. As like I said, the, the examples you've set before us from many years ago. And we don't want to leave this earth knowing that we didn't do everything that we need to do and the things that we know we should do <coughs> to help these young men and to help each other. I pray, Father, that you'll be with uh, Brother David as he heads home today and just be with him and his family and, and we're so thankful for Brother Mike and, and Brother Brian that have taken time away from their families to put this together for us. And we're just grateful for them and the love they have for you. Pray, Father, too, that you'll be Brother David and all those that are involved in the Kings of Kings program that are starting up. We just think that's an awesome thing. And again, it's up to us to teach these young men the right way. We pray, Father, too, that you'll be with us as we depart today and Hopefully the things that we've heard, we can apply. And if we don't apply those things, then it's just a waste of time. Because we know what to do, and we know how to do it. We just got to do it. Regardless if it's in the world today, it's, it's not important to a lot of folks. But we know that it is. And the only way your word is going to keep going and the only way that your kingdom's going to grow is by the things that we do and the way that we act. Pray, Father, that you'll bless the food downstairs that's been prepared. And just pray that uh, we can get nourishment from it, be able to have the physical abilities to continue to do the things that we need to do. And pray for each and every one of us, Father, as members of this congregation, that we'll be the followers that we need to be from the leadership that our elders that are, have set forth for us and just to help make their jobs much easier if we do the things that we need to do. we got to understand we need to be part of the solution and not the problem. Just pray, Father, that you'll continue to be with us and get us all home safely and bring us back tomorrow at our Sunday morning Bible study and our Sunday morning worship and continue to be with our families and help us grow and help us prosper in your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.